In this lesson, we're going to learn some methods to solve more complicated trig equations. So I'm going to have to assume in this lesson that you know how to solve something like this. Or if you have something like 5 tangent x minus 3 equals 2, that you're able to solve those things, that you're able to get things into a trig function alone equals some value and then solve it. So assuming that you have that skill, we're ready to move on to talk about more complicated trig equations. But before we get into that, let's go ahead and take a deep breath. And then we'll begin. So at this point in our in our learning about trigonometric equations, the only trig equations that we've really solved have been of the form trig x equals a. So you know you've dealt with see, sine x equals 0.8, or you've dealt with three cosine x plus one equals two. So today's lesson, we're sort of getting into how do we solve trigonometric equations that don't just have a trig function sort of sitting by itself or easy to get by itself. And the three most common tactics here are either to look for disguised quadratics and factor, um, to move everything over to one side of the equation and factor. It turns out factoring is a really, really powerful tool in solving. Um, and then the last one is to use trigonometric identities and honestly probably factor after that. There is one more thing that we're going to cover sort of near the end of the video, and that's how to deal with trig functions that have something different in the argument. And I'd like to be very clear here. Our goal in all of today's exercise is to decompose a more complicated equation down into smaller equations that are of this form. Um, and in fact, I want to be very clear, this, this video has the potential to be really long if I explain every part of every problem. So once I get down to the point that it's trig equals a, this really, really goes back to the skill that I said we needed to have at the beginning, that we can solve those. So I'm still going to go through the work for that part of it, but I'm not going to sort of explain why I'm doing what I'm doing, um, because that part really should have been clear from the previous lesson that we had. So there are a handful of skills that I need to know that you can work with in order to get through this lesson. And so I've sort of got four little basic things here. Um, and, and I would encourage you to sort of pause the video and see whether or not you can make sense of what these four things are. And if so, it means we're ready to move on with the lesson. Um, you know, if not, you can uh, sort of follow along with my explanation. So the first one, how can you simplify the square root of sine squared x? Well, the important thing to know here is that when someone writes sine squared x, what it really means is it means sine x squared. Okay, and so if someone asks you, hey, what's the square root of sine squared? They're really saying, what's the square root of the sine of x squared? And we know that we can simplify this down to being the sine of x. I suppose if I was being really, really honest with you, it would actually be the absolute value of sine x. But talking about why that is, is outside of the scope of this video. Um, and even if you don't have that, we're able to get through it. So we'll, we'll sort of talk about it when we get to that point. Um, if you're really curious about that, you can ask me about it and we, we can discuss it. Um, the second one here, how can you factor 6 sine x cosine x minus 4 sine x? Well, hopefully you recognize that these two factors, these two expressions, both have some common factors. They both have a 2 and they both have a factor of sine x. And if I were to factor those things out, I'd be left with 3 cosine x. And that second expression would only have 2 left in it. Okay. For the third one, how can you factor tangent squared x minus 4 tangent x plus 3? If this isn't something you can really clearly see, what you could do is you can let m be tangent x. And if we let m be tangent x, we can rewrite this expression as m squared minus 4m plus 3. Make that minus a little more clear. And then I think it's probably, I think it, it's, Clear to say that this will factor as m minus 3, m minus 1. And then we remember that m was tangent x, which means that my original expression can be factored as tangent x minus 3 times tangent x minus 1. Okay? And then finally, is there any way that you could use trig identities, um, you know, identities that you guys know, like uh, tangent x equals sine x over cosine x and sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. Is there any way that we could use those to simplify this last expression? Well, let's start small here. What if we just change the tangent x out for sine x over cosine x? This would be 3 sine x over cosine x times cosine x minus 2 sine squared x. 
and the cosine x's would drop out, I'd be left with 3 sine x minus 2 sine squared x. And at that point, we could even sort of go back and, and think about what we did on the second or the third examples here. We could actually factor out a sine x and be left with 3 minus 2 sine x. So hopefully you sort of understood what these four pieces were. All four of these, or the, the principles that we used in simplifying them, are things that are going to come up in actual problems that we're going to work through later in the lesson. So here's our first example. Suppose that you're asked to solve the equation cosine squared theta equals 4 ninths for theta on the interval between 0 and 360 degrees. Um, so, you know, we, we remember sort of from that, that basic skills thing that we went through, that this thing means cosine theta squared, which means that I could square root both sides of this thing, and by square rooting both sides, the left side would become cosine theta, and the right side would become plus or minus two-thirds. Okay, and I'd like to be really clear here, like the, 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 the new lesson part of today's lesson is really that right there, to say, hey, I've got this thing, I don't really know how to deal with that squared, but if I could get rid of that squared, I'd have trig function equals number, which means I can solve it the exact same way we learned in the previous lesson. So now that I'm here, I'm going to solve this thing the same way that I did before. Um, I suppose the one, the one sort of exception I would note is this cosine theta is equal to two different values. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of recognize, hey, I have cosine theta equals negative two-thirds, but I also have cosine theta equals positive two-thirds, okay? And I'm going to try and use sort of two different colors here just so that we, we recognize that these are two different things that we're solving. So this is the thing that I said that I'm not going to do a big explanation of the rest of it. I'm just going to kind of go through what this would look like. Um, I might explain a little bit more of this one, but the, on the later ones, I'm, I'm really just going to kind of go through it. So if I needed to solve this thing, I would do the inverse cosine. So I would do inverse cosine of negative two-thirds. Remembering to have my calculator in degree mode, I found that my first theta value that I got out of this thing was 131 point. Uh, eight, so I guess 132 degrees, okay? And then remembering from our lesson about, uh, you know, solving these trig functions, as soon as I get this primary solution, I immediately should think about what the secondary solution is. In the case of cosine, it's the negative of the same thing that I just got, okay? As I go back and check, this solution is on the interval, so that one's good to go. This other one is not on that interval, so I'm going to do the same thing that I did before, where I find other solutions by adding or subtracting the period length. So I'll do negative 132 degrees plus 360 degrees, because that's the period length of cosine. When I do this, I find that my other solution is, let's see here, 228 degrees, which again is on the interval. Now remember, uh, in theory, I could add and subtract 2 pi to each of these to find more solutions, but given, I'm sorry, not 2 pi, but 360, but given that this interval only goes from 0 to 360, I'm confident that I found the only two solutions here. Now that I finished that one, I need to go over and work out this other one, right? Because this problem is effectively two separate problems. So same deal, I'm going to do the inverse cosine of now positive 2 thirds, when I do that, my first solution, which I suppose I'm going to call theta 4, because I've already sort of exhausted a few of the other ideas over here. The first solution that I got was 48.2 degrees, which again, I notice is on the interval, so this one works. My other one, I would get by taking the negative of that. But again, I, you know, I notice that I'm, that I'm in the wrong place, so I'm going to add 360 degrees to that to make it on the interval. And when I do that, I get 312 degrees, which I notice is on the interval. Those are my four solutions. So I, I think the thing that I want to make really, really, really clear today is that the only part of this lesson that is new today is the beginning, where we are taking this more complicated thing and doing something to break it down into trig function equals number and trig function equals number. Everything below that is stuff that you should be comfortable with from our previous lesson. So just to be clear, for the rest of these examples, I am going to make a big deal about how we do the initial simplification, sort of the, the new stuff. The part after that where we actually solve those individual trig equations, I'm still going to show the work for, but I'm not intending to go through all of the details on those, just to try and keep the time down on the video just a bit.
as you're going through these examples, if you feel comfortable with doing those parts, feel free to go through that really quickly, get your answers, and then fast forward in the video to figure out whether you got them right to see whether or not you need to see all of my work for that. So for this next one, we're being asked to solve this equation. Okay, um, well I mentioned that one of our other tactics is to move everything over to one side and factor. So if I move everything over here, I'll wind up with 3 sine x cosine x minus 2 sine x equals 0. Right? Remember that factoring is really only useful for us as a solving method if it's equal to 0 because we need the zero product property. Now that I've done that, I can see that I've got these sine x's that are in common. So if I factor out sine x, I'm left with 3 cosine x minus 2. Okay, and at this point, I have something times something else equals zero. Okay, and I can now use the zero product property to indicate that sine x is zero. And again, I'm going to use another color to represent that this three cosine x minus two is also equal to zero. Okay, so again, this is the new part of the video. So, so at, at this point, like that's... That's all the new stuff that we're doing, right? You move everything over to one side, you factor, you set it equal to zero, now I've got these two individual pieces. And the rest of this should be a review of methods that we've done before, right? So to solve this one, I'm gonna do the inverse sine of zero. So the inverse sine of zero, that would be that x is zero. And my other solution for this would be pi minus that which means I could get pi as a solution as well. I check and notice that both of those are all in the interval. And then I can even add or subtract 2 pi to either one of these things to check for other ones. And it looks like if I do pi minus 2 pi, I'll wind up with negative pi as another solution, which again is on my interval. So I've got those three things. These are all solutions. These are all things that would make this equation true. Okay, for this other one, I'm going to need to move the 2 and the 3 over, so I'll end up with cosine x equals 2 thirds. And then I've done kind of a sneaky thing here in the setup of this video. We literally already solved this one on the previous slide. We went through the process of how to do that. You remember that one on the left was the cosine x equals negative 2 thirds, and then the one on the right was for positive 2 thirds. I suppose the only difference is that these are actually in radians instead of degrees. So if you had gone through the process and used radians in your calculators instead of degrees, the two answers that you'd find would be x equals 0 0.841, and then, so I guess I should call that x4, and then x5 would be negative 0.841. Both of those are on the interval that was given, and so these are the other two solutions. So it turns out that this equation on this interval actually has five total solutions. As you're aware, lots of times on IB questions and on the IB exam, they'll sort of give you um, like a multi-step problem to sort of help you figure out how to start the problem. So this one says, given that 3 sine squared x minus 5 sine x plus 1 equals 0, find the possible values of sine x. When they ask this, they're basically saying, we want you to figure out what sine x is. Don't worry about doing the inverse sine part. Just find out what the sine x part would have to be equal to. Um, and so hopefully what, what you're seeing here is that if we did something like let sine x equal m, we could see this initial equation as 3m squared minus 5m plus 1 equals 0. And that's something that we ought to be able to solve by like factoring or completing the square or, or the quadratic formula. And so I'm going to go ahead and go through that now. So it turns out on this one, factoring is not going to work for us. And I don't know that I really feel like doing completing the square because of that 3 that's in the front. So I'm going to go ahead and do the quadratic formula. Um, so we know that m here would have to be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, so that's basically 12, all over 6. So that means m is 5 plus or minus the square root of 13 all over 6. And just to be very, very clear, that means that there are two things m could be. m is either 5 plus the square root of 13 over 6, or m is 5 minus the square root of 13 all over 6, okay? So when the problem says, hey, find the possible values of sine, we've effectively found the possible values of sine. 
with one teeny tiny exception. Remember that the range of sine, sine can only go between positive one and negative one. The only outputs we can get are between positive one and negative one, right? But look at this right here. The square root of 13, the square root of 13 is like three point something. So this up here is like nine-ish. Nine divided by six is like one and a half. That's outside of the range. This value, the sine x cannot possibly be larger than one. And so that one's actually not a possible value of sine. This other one, on the other hand, is 5 minus 3-ish. So this is, you know, like 1 or 2-ish divided by 6. This is definitely within the acceptable range for sine. So the answer for part A on this is that this is the only value that sine can possibly take. Okay. Now part B goes on and says, hence, so using what you just did, hence solve this equation on this interval. Well, we now know that sine has to be 5 minus root 13 over 6. And so now, again, this problem becomes exactly the same thing that we had been doing on in our previous lesson. I just need to do the inverse sine of both sides and follow the rest of the process. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to do it fairly quickly. So this means x is the inverse sine of 5 minus root 3 root 13 over 6. Fortunately, this is a calculator problem, so we just throw this at the calculator, making sure that we're in radian mode. My first solution, the primary solution that my calculator gave me was 0 0.235. That's definitely on the interval that I was given, so I boxed that one. My second solution I get by doing that first solution um, subtracted from pi, so pi minus 0.235. And when I do that, I wound up with 2.91. I can tell that I don't need to add or subtract 2 pi because uh, that's as long as my interval is. So I'm going to say one more time. Remember that the new lesson is sort of about this part. Hey, sometimes we need to simplify an equation to get it into a single trig function equals some number. But after that, this is the exact same process we've been using before. So I've mentioned, I think, in the video a couple of times that one of our secrets, one of the secret weapons that we have is, is using factoring and things like that. So if you ever come across a trig, uh, trig equation that has lots of different trig functions in it, often it means that you should use identities to sort of transform them. So in this, this example, I think, was actually in one of the, one of the warm-up things that we kind of had near the beginning. If I change my tangent into sine x over cosine x... Even if I leave everything else alone, what you'll notice is the cosine x's drop out. I've got 3 sine x minus 2 sine squared x. Just realized I missed the squared there. Um, so now I've got this thing. And, and the question said, rewrite this in terms of a single trigonometric function. I mean, yay, I did it. There, there it is, right? For part b. Hence, solve this equation. Notice this is the exact same expression, just equal to zero. Solve that thing on this interval, right? So now I'm being asked to solve 3 sine x minus 2 sine squared x equals zero. Um, and we we'll pause the video for a moment. Like, what, what method or how, how, what am I going to do here to set this up for solving? Um, well, we can factor out a sine x. And when I factor out that sine x, what I have left is 3 minus 2 sine x equals 0. And then using the zero product property, I'm going to have sine x equals 0. And I'm going to have 3 minus 2 sine x equals 0. Okay, This one on the right, it looks like I need to do a little bit of work with. I'm going to need to move the 3 over and divide the 2. Here I get sine x equals 3 halves. And now I have my two individual trig equations. This remember this this again is like this is where the new lesson ends. I've gotten this thing broken down. Now I just follow the same process I did on on any of my previous previous work. The blue equation over here is actually really great news. Remember that sine and cosine both can only be between negative one and positive one, which means this value is too large. So this one is going to have no solutions. And I realized in that example that I did previously, I really should have provided a reason for that. Um, so I, I apologize that I didn't do that. This has no solutions um, because, uh, you know, negative 1 has to be less than or equal to sine x. Less than, basically, sine has to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Okay. 
Okay, so that's going to give us no solutions. For this one that's over here on the left, um, we actually had this exact one before, and the solutions that we got were negative pi, 0, and pi. So if you need to see how to do that one, you can bounce back and take a look at it. So this is now sort of going to be the last little segment of the video. I mentioned at the beginning of the video, in fact, we typed a little thing in about sometimes the argument, the thing inside of the trig function is not just x, and we need a method for dealing with that. You guys have heard me use this word a lot, but just to be clear, the definition of the word argument as it applies to functions is that the argument of a function is basically the expression that is um, composed into the function or plugged into so plugged in or composed into the function. For example, the argument of the function f of 2x minus 1 is 2x minus 1. Okay? Um, now just to be clear, uh, we know how to solve these things, but we don't have any experience with how do I deal with a sine of 2x minus 1 equals 1 fourth. So that's really what we're going to be getting into next in these, in these final two examples. So I'm going to go ahead and do an example, and then we're going to sort of talk about what our method is, and then we'll do one final example that you can try on your own. So solve the equation sine 2x equals 1 third on this interval. My method here is really going to be to do something like let m equal 2x. Okay, so I'm going to let m equal 2x. My problem is now sine m equals 1 third. The only like kind of catch on this thing is... Because I changed my variable to m here, I need to change these bounds. My original bounds were x equals negative pi over 2 to x equals positive pi over 2. But now x is m over 2, so m over 2, negative pi over 2, m over 2, positive pi over 2. And we see that m can be between negative pi and positive pi. So it's sort of like our original equation was in terms of x and had an interval in terms of x. Now I have an equation that's in terms of m, and I know that my m value has to be between pi, negative pi and pi. Okay. At this point, I'm going to solve this thing the exact same way I have on all of the other ones before, right? I'm going to do my inverse sine. Okay. When I do that and use the calculator, I got that my first answer here was 0 0.340, and my second answer uh, was 2.80. Uh, are these two answers? Are these two answers within the m interval that was given? And the answer is yes. Both of those are within that interval. Can I get more answers? by adding or subtracting 2 pi to either one of these two things? The answer is no. If I do that, it's going to take me outside of these bounds. So I've basically found the two answers. These are going to be the only two answers to the problem. The only catch is these aren't actually the answers to the problem. These are m values. So the last thing I need to do is I need to go back up and realize, hey, remember that m was 2x? So 2x1 will be this, and 2x2 will be this. And then I just divide both of these things by 2. So the answers I got for these things are 0 0.170 and 1.40. These are the actual two answers to the problem. So I showed the method once. I'm going to go ahead and sort of like write out what the method is in the next slide, and then we'll have one final example that you can try on your own. All right, so step zero, um, if necessary, reduce the problem or the equation to a single trigonometric function equal to a number. Um, second, you're going to make a substitution for that argument. So, you know, let m equal the thing that's inside or let y equal the thing that's inside. Then you use the substitution to modify the interval. After that, step three, you're going to find solutions the exact same way you did before, right? Th this step here is the thing that we learned previously and that I'm not focusing on in this lesson. And then in step four, remember that you need to convert your solution back into the original variables. I'll admit that there's a lot of space in these for like algebraic errors. So you do need to take care. Um, but I do want to point out these are all steps that you guys can do. So I know that we're going along on the video. If you need to, take a deep breath before we do this next one. And let's give it a shot. All right, so here we go. 
we want to solve the equation secant of x over 2 minus 1 equals negative 3. Um, and for the last one, I, I decided to really go all out. We're even going to deal with, with a, a, a reciprocal trig function here. So our first step is, like we remember, ooh, these reciprocal trig functions, our solution for dealing with those things is to rewrite them in their non-reciprocal form. So the first thing I'm going to do is just say, yep, this thing is 1 over the cosine of x over 2 minus 1 equals negative 3. Now notice I'm not reciprocating here. I'm just rewriting secant in its reciprocal form. But I don't want to deal with this thing as 1 over cosine. I want it to be cosine. So now I will reciprocate both sides. So this I can write as the cosine of x over 2 minus 1 equals negative 1 third. And at this point, yay, I have this as trig function equals number. The only problem is that the argument inside is a little bit complicated. So now I'm going to do that thing I did before, where I let m equal x over 2 minus 1. Okay, so if I let m equal x over 2 minus 1, that would mean that m plus 1 equals x over 2. So x is 2m plus 2. And the reason that I needed to do that is, um, actually, no, I guess I didn't. Well, I'm going to need that later. Um, I do want to change these bounds because I need to know I need to know what these new bounds are going to be for the thing. So when I plug the m in, I've got cosine m equals one third, and when I plug zero in, my lower m bound is going to be zero over two minus one, which is negative one. My upper bound is going to be. 4 over 2 minus 1, which is, let's see here, 1. Okay, so my m values here have to be between negative 1 and positive 1. Okay, so now, now that I've gotten this converted to a new variable and I have the new bounds for this thing, I can go about doing the inverse cosine. So inverse cosine of 1 third, plugging that into the calculator. I got that my solutions here are m is 1.23, that's the first one, and my second one was negative 1.23, okay? Now, you'll notice that these numbers, these solutions, well, one of them at least, is on the original interval, but that's not actually what I care about. What I care about is finding the solutions that are on the modified interval. Neither one of these things is inside of this modified interval, which means even if I change them back, even if I plug the 1.23 or the negative 1.2 into these things, these things, it's not going to fall into this interval, which means this problem has no solutions. I know that might have been a little bit anticlimactic, but I wanted to make sure that you know like that that's a thing that can happen. Um, sometimes one of them is not a solution, sometimes they both are, sometimes they both end up not working. So I hope that that all made sense. If you have questions or you're confused at all, please let me know so that I can help. Best of luck.